So uh, thank you for being here. It's really a privilege to be in conversation with Ruth. Uh, I'm going to begin by maybe thinking about what kind of conversation this is going to be, because Ruth is really a, an extraordinary writer. And she doesn't just write poetry. She writes memoir. Um, she writes about wildlife. Um, she's work, she works with artists. Um, so I'm going to take us to Elizabeth Bishop. And she has a poem called Little Exercise. And in each stanza of this poem, she asks the reader to imagine a scene. She builds it step by step. She starts from the sky. It's a very stormy sky. Then she moves to the wildlife around her. Then she moves to the architecture. And then she finally comes down to a person. So what it is, it is a practice in association of pulling in very diverse ideas that somehow together bring insight and empathy. The final stanza of the poem goes, think of someone sleeping in the bottom of a rowboat tied to a mangrove root or the pile of a bridge. Think of him as uninjured, barely disturbed. When I read Ruth's work, what I am most struck by is its leaps in association, how she manages to pull in various ideas with precision and a kind of rigor. So today I hope that our conversation is a bit like Elizabeth Bishop's little exercise, uh, where we move back and forth between very broad ideas and hopefully find that they are connected. Um, I, I thought I would ask you to begin by reading something from either the snake book or the tiger book, and yeah, we'll go from there. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Poona. Well, it's lovely to be here. Um, I hope this is, yes, it's working okay. So. Um, <clears throat> I've written really two, so far, two books about Indian wildlife. One is a memoir about tigers in which I started in India and finished in India but went <clears throat> through all the range countries from Nepal, Bhutan, Sumatra, Southeast Asia, Russia, China and then back to India to ask the question, can the... Not, not yet. Keep it down like that? Yes, yeah. Can the tiger be saved? And since then, the tiger has tiger numbers have come up in India. So <coughs> that was good. Um, the other one is I'm going to start with is is a novel, and it's very much set. It begins in Karnataka, and it's very much set around two people who are king cobra specialists, herpetologists, and conservationists. And I wanted to do this because this is a, an encounter between the wild and the tame, or the wild and the human. <coughs> and um, it's, this is what I'm going to do next. I'm going, now going to start. I'm here, really, because I'm going to go off to Mudamalai on Saturday, and I want to study elephants. And I think <coughs> the relation between the, the wild and the human is something which we all, in this apocalyptic time of environment that we are in now, we are all concerned with. So here we are. 9th of March, Karnataka, India. <coughs> Rainforest in the dry season. If you had looked closely at those black zigzag lines under green bamboo, you would have seen they were not the shadow of overlapping leaves, but edges between the charcoal gray scales of her head. You could have admired the bronze shadow in each honey flame iris, the pearl pale ring encircling each black pupil, and maybe have seen the whole of her, a dark knot on a double-decked mound of dead bamboo leaves, high as a man's thigh. Suddenly, far off, there was a rasping cry of a leopard calling cubs, and she part spread her hood. She had no external ear, she would not have heard us talking beside her, but this low-frequency call hit the side of her head, traveled from her skull to her skin into jaw muscle and quadrate bone and flicked her inner ear. She dabbed out her tongue. The prongs, two tubes of glistening black shading to gray-pink, waved in different directions, tasting the air, 
decoding scents and calling them into cavities in her mouth, lined with nerve endings. To her, as to all snakes, taste and smell were one. So this snake is sitting on her nest, and somebody is watching her. A slight, bespectacled man, utterly silent, whose palms were hot and rather wet. Her heart had three chambers. He knew that. He was a biologist. His own had four. He wanted to keep the blood going safely through them all, which it would stop doing if it came into contact with one drop of the neurotoxin toxin being manufactured 20 feet away by salivary glands in her head. Some people call king cobras aggressive. But aggressive, he would tell you, is really only interpretation. He'd say, active defensive himself, and anyway, each one is different. Snakes are like beings from outer space, a totally different intelligence. Their brains and emotions are not large or complex, but they do have them, and king cobras have them in spades. So she goes off to have a drink, and he um, tests the humidity in the nest and the temperature of the eggs, and that's all good, and then start, he slowly starts to straighten. But above him came a low, low roary growl, and he froze. He was one of the few people in the world who knew what that growl was. King cobras do not hiss like other snakes. They expel air through holes in their trachea. Now he saw a hood towering above him, her golden throat, black-edged like a mourning card, two feet from his nose. In that electric moment, when human meets king cobra eye to eye, each is liable to confuse the other's motive. Keep still, he thought. Keep very still. He knew the biology all too well. She could force into his tissues 0.7 milliliters of citron-tinged venom, enough to kill an elephant or 20 people. Running was hopeless. He'd still be in her range six feet away, and she could charge amazingly fast. No eye contact. Let her gaze. She would do what she decided. The park did not stock King Cobra anti-venin, which was only made in Thailand. And anyway, he would never reach the guard post. Within minutes, the neurotoxins would stun his nervous system and slow his breathing. Paralysis would follow, as the textbooks said, very fast. Looking down at his feet, like a boy confessing to a broken rule, he stood immobile for what seemed a very long time. He concentrated, as only a scientist or a poet can, on precise names for the leaves he was looking at. He felt her eyes upon him. He was in the hands of the living God, of neurosynapses in a reptile brain. When he looked up, she was gone. So, as that very lovely opening to the novel shows us, nature is very central to a lot of your work, but it's not just a setting and it's not just a theme. You seem to think, use the natural world as a way to think about the world we humans live in, and um, you often talk about the natural world in a very scientific way in order to talk about it with care. They're somehow not contradictory. And um, I'm curious about how your interest in conservation, because uh, both Tigers in Dread Weather and um, Lives of uh, Where the Serpent li uh, Lives, are they both ask us to consider conserving the natural world, and not necessarily for any instrumental end, but because it exists. Um, and so I was wondering, what, how does conservation connect with writing for you? That's a really interesting question. When I first went into a tiger forest, or proper tiger forest, it was in Panna, in Madhya Pradesh, and um, I was so excited. It was very dark early morning, and 
um, I was with a, a scientist and a forest guide. And I realized that here I was, I knew there were quite a lot of tigers in that forest, and that every single leaf, there was a teak, it was a teak forest, so every leaf that fell, or every squirrel running down, or otter, the first, I think the first thing we saw in that forest was an otter eating a fish. And I thought, in some complicated way, those are all related to the tigers. I may never see a tiger, probably won't, but the tiger is the meaning of this forest, and that made me think about writing and about poetry. And there are so many ways, when you go into a poem or a novel, um, you see so many things. I was in a book club yesterday after yesterday morning. Everybody in the book club had different readings of the book they were discussing. Um, but those are all valid experiences of the book. And just as the squirrel is there, and the otter is there, and the leaf is there. And we may never see the complete meaning. What is the complete meaning of a forest um, or of a book but, or a poem? But the tiger is the meaning at the center, at the heart. Anyway, that's what, that's, you know, maybe that's a completely erroneous idea, but that was my feeling. And I think it comes from very early, um, my, from being read to by my mother, who was a biologist, and just that sort of sense of the meaning of, is something that you need to look for. So in the Tiger book, uh, in which you go on this crazy journey around the world to find the wild tiger, um, you write, the wild animal is not just a biological thing. It has particular knowledge, the relation to the landscape for which it evolved. Can you talk a little bit more about this idea of um, wild animals having a particular knowledge and how um, we might share that knowledge as well by way of inhabiting a landscape? That's very interesting. Yes. Um, so a lot of the tiger thoughts that I had and learning that I did was on the ground in Periya and, and Pana and then later in other places. Um, but I was reading all these, these things. And um, the point about a, a wild animal is wild in the place where, where it evolved to be. And that's why it's so important in a way in India, for example, to conserve the tiger because conserving a tiger, you're conserving the forests which, which contain it. You know, the Mahabharata says, do not take the, 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 the tiger as the guardian of the forest. Do not take the forest away from the tiger or the tiger away from the forest. And um, it's the guardian of the forest because if the forest went, the, you know, the monsoon rivers would go, they would spill over the land. Um, but in order to, to conserve, say, 35 tigers in one forest, you have to have enough for them to eat. So you have to have a maximum number of deer for them to eat and wild boar. For the wild boar and for the deer, you have to have the right sort of vegetation. For the right sort of vegetation, you have to have the pollinators, you have to have the monkeys, you have to have the birds. They have to have food, they have to have insects, they have to have reptiles. So the whole thing is one complex thing. And so the tiger is, is the sort of sense of the guardian of it in, a, in um, biologically. By conserving the tiger, you're conserving the forest and therefore the landscape for us. Um, and the same is true in other places. It's you know, I mean, my, I come from what was the United Kingdom until tonight. Um, <laughs> um, and um, I remember once in Scotland, I was talking about tigers. It was a place, a zoo, where they had some tigers, and there was a very brilliant tiger biologist there. And um, after, after, afterwards came questions, and within five minutes, we were talking about badgers, because badgers are the big, are the carnivores up there in those highlands, and the badgers eat their chickens just as tigers here will, will eat cows or endanger human life and so on. So it's the same problem everywhere. In order to conserve, the, the, the people who are on the front line are, are the people who are um, threatened by the animal in some way. And so um, we have to share this landscape with them. So since you wrote uh, both Where the Serpent Lives and Tigers in Red Weather, the world has changed. Uh, conservation has changed. We have news reports in India that um, tiger populations have increased. Uh, so how do you reflect upon these works now when uh, our conversations around conservation have possibly changed a little? They have changed a little, but... Um the principles in which I wrote the tigers and weather, red weather haven't changed. And actually, as it happened, I was doing my tiger journeys at a very bad poaching time in India, so between 2001 and 2004. 
and you know, all the tigers were poached out of Soriska. And people wanted to cover it up, and the park manager of Soriska said, oh, they've migrated, which is rubbish because tigers don't migrate. Um, and um, so they have come back from that, and there is better sorts of counting of tigers happening. Um, but um, tiger, all the animals and the forests are constantly being threatened by roads, by people wanting to make um, uh, all sorts of different things, dams, timber felling. So the principles haven't changed that much. Tigers, as it happens, have, but not much else. Um, but within that wider thing, um, you know, there's, in the last six months, the world really has, thanks to a, a, a Swedish schoolgirl, um, woken up to the fact that our whole world has been menaced by the, the changes to the environment which we have done. And um, I think the battle between ourselves and the environment, or, or, or what we've done to the environment, are going to happen everywhere, very rapidly. Climate change, there are going to be more and more climate change refugees. Um, the UN last week passed a resolution saying that it was illegal for any country to refuse climate refugees. But what's going to happen on the shores of Myanmar or Orissa when... Um, Bangladesh, the whole of Bangladesh is up to Dhaka is, is, and beyond is, um, is the rising seas. Who's, who's going to take them in? Or all those African... I mean, it's, you know, when, when a lot of London, when New York, when Mumbai, all of those are underwater, what's going to happen to the other people? It's going to be very scary. Yeah. Shall I read that Maltese poem? Um, sure. Uh, or I thought you could read Choice. Okay, all right, read Choice. Um, so this is a book um, about migration, and it took me 12 years to write this book. I called it the Mara Crossing, which is about the great wildebeest migration um, from the Serengeti up through Africa. They take six months, and then they cross a, a river. It's not that big a river. It's, you know, if I was standing at the edge there, I could get to the back of the auditorium. That's about how far, how how, you know, in some places, how wide the river is. The problem with that river is that it's full of enormous crocodiles. And the crocodiles are just waiting for this migration to happen. And um, so these weary herds, the wildebeest, the zebra, and the little Thompson's gazelle, um, they've trekked for six months. They've brought up their calves and foals. Um, some have died on the way. They're very, very hungry. They're very exhausted. And on the other side of this river, there's lovely green grass. Um, and they have to get through the river. And um, most of them do, but a lot of them do not. Um, and I'm sorry to say that a lot of human tourists go there to photograph the ones that are not getting across, with the crocodiles. But um, I, it struck me that this is the image for all migration, whether it's human or animal. So it starts with cell migration, um, because cells migrate in our bodies um, for good reasons. One to create um, the fetus. So if a, if a woman is pregnant, cells are migrating to the fetus created. And when we're sick, when we have an infection, if I have an infection in my wrist, cells will migrate to the site of infection in order to protect me. So cell migration is for two reasons, to create new life and to defend the organism. And so I was fascinated by that. And of course, if you extrapolate from that to human migration, well, immigrants have, have Done. Look, at, look at America, it wouldn't exist practically, or not, certainly not as it is, without migration. Um, so um, I was thinking, I did three years on study of birds, of bird migration. And there's one little poem here which somehow has, has struck a chord in lots of different people. Um, there was a group of migrants in Scotland who made a film based on this poem, which is a tiny little poem. And um, another, there's a Canadian immigrant who's now a jazz singer, and she's made a, a, a song over the, with this poem. Over. And it's just about a little robin. Because if this is in my garden in London, and robins, are, European robins, are partial migrants. That means some of them go and some of them stay. Now, the ones that go, all the evidence is that it's normally the females. Because, why? Well, it's risky to go, and it's risky to stay. You might freeze to death if you're a little bird that big. But uh, the males are quite fierce and aggressive, even though they turn up on Christmas cards. And um, they will be defending in the winter. They'll be defending their feeding territory. And they might 
peck the brains out of these, of these poor females. So the females go. And, um, um, so, but it's, it's a question, how do you go, how do you stay? And I was thinking of um, Jewish friends of mine or whose, whose relations got out of Vienna and Germany just before the, the Hitler, Hitler, Hitler sort of guillotine came down. One woman in particular who was the last, the kinder, kinder transport out of Vienna, and she told her, her, her parents, we must go. And they said, no, no, it'll be all right. You don't understand. So she was a teenager. She got out. All her family died. And so that's the choice. Um, choice. Digging a bush up. Pitching into damp earth. Getting out clutch arms and fingertip veins as easily broken as silk. I look into the mica eye of a robin. This is what we say we all want, the choice to go, to stay. But how does a robin decide? How does anyone? Um. When you use the robin uh, to, you're talking about the robin, yes, but you are talking about people. But uh, in the Mara Crossing, you make a very clear distinction between how animals migrate and how humans migrate. Although you do start from the cell, uh, you talk about how the return isn't necessary for humans. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, well, I am. I, um I divided it really into go and stay. So if you go and stay, that's called colonization. It could be called colonization. I mean, that's what the biologists say when a plant colonizes a new area. And that's how, where we all came from once. We were all originally, we all came from algae, you know, small, small blue-green algae floating around in the sea. And then it gradually came out onto the land. And then what it did, it started to spread. And that's the basic go and stay migration. It multiplied like... like Noah's sons. Um, and that's what a lot of animals and, and trees have done. Trees are the first great land migrants. Um, but the go and come back is what the birds do. And that's because the, the world, the globe is spinning. The temperature changes. The Arctic gets, is cold and then gets warm. And everybody comes up there to, to eat insects and things. And then they leave it when it gets cold. And they migrate down to South America or somewhere. So, um, but human beings have mainly gone to go and stay. So we came, all human beings seem to have come out of Africa at some point and um, spread through uh, the different continents. Actually, there's quite a lot of internal migration. I mean, here, for instance, I mean, there are migrant workers who might come to Bangalore to, to work for a season and then go back to their villages. So human beings vary, but on the whole, colonization, trade, that's how Islam came to Africa, how Islam came to, for instance, or, and Christianity. All these different religions, they move with colonizers, traders. So the way I see it is that human migration also seems to have a kind of possibly a, a violence associated with it, a kind of hostility. And you do talk about um, the hostile planet. Um, and you say that uh, no migrant is um, free from facing a hostile planet. And I was thinking about the choice. The choice humans have is very different from the choice a robin has. And somehow that seems to connect to this kind of violence from which you get colonization, from which you get refugees. So um, yeah, what are, what are the hostilities that set human migration apart from the natural the natural okay. world. Well, I'm not sure it's that different, really, because it's all really about resources. I mean, first of all, the hostile planet is hostile to animals and people in the same way. So the um, people crossing the Mediterranean from Libya to Spain or Greece um, are facing the sea and storms, and so are, are the birds. Are the birds the birds cross, take the shortest sea crossing, just like the people. Um, they are also crossing the desert, the Sahara. So bird migrants also have to cross the, the Sahara. Um, and so the planet is always difficult to deal with, as well as offering food, offering resources. But once you get there, birds will arrive 
in a place, for instance, the bar-headed goose, which, which flies, nests maybe in Kazakhstan, flies over the Himalayas and, and ends up in Assam. Immediately they're there. They, it's as if they've done nothing. Himalayas, piece of cake. They just sort of start pecking around, eating the grass and eating things on it. Um, and if there are, but they will try and chase off other people in their particular patch. And I think that's what humans do too. I mean, the whole story of migration to America is, you know, people got there and then um, more people came in the 19th century. And then the ones who got there started putting a guillotine down. So all through the early 1900s, there are, you know, the No Chinese Act or the No This That or the No Act, Other Act like that. And that's what Trump is doing now. You know, his, his grandfather was an illiterate 16-year-old um, escaping drought in a part of Germany. And um, now he's um, putting, putting, you know, saying no migrants to... Well, we all know about that, uh, yeah. And <laughs> even in India, that's what we're protesting, a law that deals with migrants coming into this country. Um, I was wondering if you could, now that we've come to contemporary politics, if you might read the Lesbos poem and talk a little bit about that and how that project uh, departs from uh, the migration book. Yeah. Well, I'm actually, in my, in the, there's going to be a new updated. I'm going to be putting this into the migration, new, new version of the print. So I've lived a lot in Greece. And um, in 2015, I'm sure you saw on the news, these, when the Syrian war started, huge numbers of Syrians fleeing, getting, getting, going up to sort of the, the edge of Turkey. And you can just see it. You can see Lesbos and Turkey from each other easily, naked eye. It's just there. Um, but they, there were a lot of smugglers, there was a lot of politics around it, and um, there were all these factories making, um, what are they called, life belts, life jackets, which actually didn't work. Amazingly, they charged these poor Syrians huge sums to, for the, you know, to take them over and give them these life jackets, sell them these life jackets, and they didn't work, a lot of them, and a lot of them drowned. And the Lesbos, this small island, but it's a quite small island, as, as, as our Greek islands go, it's, it's a biggish island, but it's, um, this one island has become a kind of microcosm of, of the, the problems the world is facing. Um, they were very hospitable. Greeks have a sort of great sense, natural sense of hospitality. When they saw all these people drowning, they, they brought them in, they gave them blankets, they gave them food, and then they also, um, they also pulled the bodies from the sea and buried them. And the mayor insisted they should be buried in the, um, in the local graveyard. And I talked to one girl who said, you know, we didn't know were there traditions. They were Muslim. Should we put flowers on their grave or not? And you, but they very carefully annotated what they found. So in Greek, you know, a girl, three years old, boy, 14, um, all written in marble and the date. Um, and, you know, heart-rending things, a little teddy bear on one grave or a, a toy caterpillar on another. Um, and then I talked to a, a newspaper editor, and she said, well, look, in 1922, there was a huge massacre of the Greeks. There was a, there was a fight between the Greeks and the Turks, and a lot of Greeks were massacred, and a lot of Greeks fled. And where did they come to? They came to Lesbos. And she said, the stories, when we pulled these people out of the waves, the stories they told us were just like the stories my grandfather told me when she was a refugee, child refugee in 1922 from Lesbos. So there was a sense of empathy. Like Aristotle says about tragedy, pity, and fear, you pity them because they're suffering. You fear because they are human and you are human too, and your fate is bound up with theirs. You see your fate in, the, in yours. So I wrote this poem, and this is what we did at the Viennese Biennale. When I was there, talking to Syrians, going into the camps, interviewing people, it was only a year after they had come, I phoned up a, a Syrian artist, a friend of mine, and said, um, we must do something. These are your countrymen. I, this is a country I've lived in and given to me a lot. We must, I want to honor the courage of these people who are coming and the generosity of the people who are welcoming them. So this is what this poem is about. Um, and we have done this. And he was already making little boats from mudguards, bicycle mudguards. And um, he, um, we did it in Fitzwilliam Museum, first of all. And he had discovered three boats 
from the third century BC, from Syria, which was then Phoenicia and, and Syria, and they were, they had always been they had been the great merchants across this sea between Greece and what's now Greece and Turkey. Um, so it was a sort of tradition. It's a sea which has been very prosperous, full of trade, but also a very very treacherous sea, full of winds that suddenly swoop up like that. So I could I can read this. Okay. Um, Dark water, burning world. The waves talk to their gods. The waves have their prey. The dead bump sideways in gullies gouged from gray fire. An arm, a trailing bloom sodden in the surf. Where does the wave end and water around it begin? How do you separate self from the other, edge from the flesh? Shadows of ourselves, no more than a shiver on water, then another life and another, like the waves, and the dead, face down, slamming the shore. Last night, we waited again. We listened to the dark beside bales of silver survival blankets donated by foreign charities. We listened to night wind, the sighing of pine tree and tamarisk, slap, slap of water on rock slap sap of our hearts. This is where they come. And their stories, our stories. My grandmother, a girl, escaping the furnace and murder of Smyrna. This is how it begins, claiming a new place on earth, through waves like rings of a tree, rings of the centuries, blown furrows over the sea that has known so many battles, so many deaths, slant to the foam and stones of our island's edge. And the families broken, the boy who went ahead to Europe lost, the father a forgotten hand whose fingers feel for the dark. Find the lowest star on the horizon, she said to her firstborn, 15 last year. He set out alone. Fix your eyes on that all night and you'll be safe. A bird's soul batters its way for Germany, impossible to penetrate as the emeralds of paradise. Moon after moon has gone by, waiting, forking out more and more money for smugglers, for their excuses. The right time, the right wind, surveillance, no moon, wait a while longer. All for this terror on the waters alone. Those facing backward see smudges of rose like fire on the black lace sky. That was our home. The wave rolls over. We feel it thrash through the thin rubber skin of the dinghy. How it hates us and our life jackets bought at blood price. Not in our time, Lord. Yes, in our time. And the heart tap-tapping its prison of bone. Will this be the wave? This mirror maze of muscle fluted like the moon, spray pelt and wave crest, hour by hour, denser and colder, that will shoot us rocking and spilling through the quilt of night on the windy sea down to the blue cathedrals, or wash us up on rocks at a long gazed at shore. Where there was nothing or night, where there was nothing, just gray mist, here is a shape abandoned by Charon, steering through the small starlight of cell phones, bursting on rocks, lancing the skin, pull them out of the sticks, find the rhythm. Wet to the bone, they hug one another, they shiver and they cry, whispering trees, our language strange, no doubt, and our hands rough, slippery, pulling them out from the last tug of waves to a sleepy burble of doves in dawn's crumpled blaze, wet faces lit for each other, as if water kept its shape after the jug has broken one shining, petrified moment before the shattered pieces fall away. That's a very beautiful poem. And as much sadness as there is in that poem, it's also a poem about survival and um, about people helping each other through these very, very difficult times to survive. And um, in uh, the Mara Crossing, 
you talk about survival and the way um, nature survives and the way humans survive, a uh, human survive, and you say nature is indifferent to the individual and frighteningly wasteful, but the species su survives. And that is somewhat antithetical to that poem um, because the this um, is not indifferent to the individual. It's about a care for an individual. But I was very curious about this idea of survival, which you also say comes from Darwin. And so I thought we could move a little bit to think about survival and Darwin and what he's meant to your work. OK, so um, you may have read that, that, that he was my great-great-grandfather. He was my mother's mother's father. Mother's mother's grandfather. Um, and um, I had never sort of thought much about it. It was just something that, you know, it was part of the background until I started working on, on him. Um, and, or really, until I started doing the Tiger Book, because it was when I was working for conservation, I realized evolution is the founding of biology. And um, um, he, he also, I loved working on him, because a, bi a biographer of Darwin said me, told me once, um, everybody who works on Darwin falls a bit in love with him because he's such a nice person. He's, um, and he's careful. I mean, there's a lovely story that um, a friend of his was asking him one night, he was staying there, um, where did you most feel the presence of the sublime? Because he, was, not, was he was not an atheist, but he had lost his belief in the Christian God. Um, but he... Um, where, what about the sublime? And he said, well, I think I felt it most in the Andes. <laughs> so they all went to bed. They put the fire out. And then about one o'clock, half past one at night, this friend of his heard a little knock at his door. And there was Darwin in his nightshirt and his nightcap saying, I think I've been thinking about it a lot, but I think I misled you. I did not feel the sub presence of the sublime most in the Andes. I am sure I felt it most in the forests of Brazil. <laughs> So he just wanted to make sure he got it right. <laughs> and, and it's a sort of very conscientious mind that he had, attending to small details, and that was so nice. Shall I read the poem about when he first arrives in the tropics? Because, you know, most people here, I guess, have, have grown up in the tropics, but he did not. And he had read, he'd been to um, greenhouses, which had some tropical plants, and he'd read Alexander von Humboldt, and he was so excited. As a young man, he was 29, and he was so excited, finally. It was in the Cap Verde Islands. And um, he, to, to actually be in this, in this environment, to see these things he didn't know about, he wanted to learn about, um, he was just overwhelmed. Um, so here he is. And this is taken from his, I wanted to use his words a lot, because he wrote very well. Um, he, he actually studied Latin and Greek. And since I studied Latin and Greek, I think it was very good for his prose style that he studied Latin and Greek. Um, but he didn't, he really, he wanted to be a scientist. He didn't like doing it very much. Um, anyway, here he is. This is from his, uh, I'll, I'll, you'll see when I'm quoting from him. Um, and this poem is called, Like Giving to a Blind Man Eyes. And this is, you've got to understand, this is January 1832. He's standing in Elysium. Palm leaves, like a dream of fountains, green, banana leaves, like rivulets over his head. The jade of tamarind, follicles, pinnacles, whorl, bowl, and thorn. I expected a good deal. I had read Humboldt and was afraid of disappointment. How utterly vain such fear is, none can tell, but those who have seen what I have today. On a rock of Africa, he is alone with his enchantment, so much and so unknown. It is not only the grace of forms, the richness of new colors, but the numbering, numberless, confusing associations rushing on the mind. He walks through damp, warm air. He smells it, tastes it like earth, like wine. He is possessed by chlorophyll and the calls of unknown birds. He wades into the sea. An octopus puffs black at him and then turns hyacinths red and darts for color. 
He can spot it watching him. He's discovered something wonderful. He tests the color against his colored card. The sailors laugh. They know all about that blush. He feels a fool, but he's touching volcanic rock for the first time. And his coral on its native stone. Often at Edinburgh have I gazed at little pools of water left by tide. From tiny corals on our shore, I pictured larger ones. Little did I think how exquisite, still less expect my hope of seeing them to come true. Never in my wildest castles in the air did I imagine this. The tropics, every step a new surprise. New insects fluttering about, still newer flowers. It has been for me a glorious day, like giving to a blind man eyes. But don't you think they'd like to hear about when he realizes that uh, yes. when he comes back from, from his five years, sort of like a gap year, as, uh, that's what he thought of it at first, for five year gap year, on this voyage on the Beagle, he comes back, um, a little bit of culture shock back in London, and he sends all his, his, um, you know, his rocks and his specimens out to experts to study. And he does realize through studying that, that he, he realized this is an amazing thing. He's still not, um, yeah, he's. He, he's, he's still under 30, sorry, he left sort of when he was about sort of 22. Um, and um, he realizes that um, natural selection is the, is, the, um, is the mechanism by which species will adapt and change. This was anathema in early 19th century Christianity because God had obviously um, created every single living thing that was on the planet now. Um, or they wouldn't have used the word planet. So the idea that one beetle would then gradually adapt and become another beetle, that was blasphemy. So he had to be very, very careful about it. So he, he sat on this for a long time. But as he studied it, as he did his research and so on, he began to thought, think he, he ought to do a spot of natural selection himself. Um, and um, so he needed a wife. He wanted a wife. Um, but, um, so he wrote out, being a methodical young man, who actually also liked laughing, um, he wrote out this balance sheet, or I've called it the balance sheet. One, freedom to go where I please. Choice of society, and little of it. Conversation of clever men in clubs. No one to interfere with solitude I need. Not forced to visit relatives. <laughs> or bend in every trifle. Whoever she is might hate London. Children are anxiety, responsibility, expense. Unable to read in the evening. Not so much money for books. There could be misrule in the house, quarreling even. Banished a country, becoming fat, indolent fool. I should never know French. See America, go up in a balloon. But no children. No second life, no one to care in old age. Why continue working all day with no sympathy from near and dear? But who, who could it be? Two, children, if it please God. A constant companion and friend in old age. An object to be loved and played with. Better than dog. <laughs> A home and someone to care for it. Female chat. Good for one's health. <laughs> Charm of music, perhaps. Terrible loss of my time. But my God, picture a whole life spent like a neuter bee working in grime and smoke of a London house all day alone. Then think of a nice, soft wife on a sofa looking at me with a good fire and books. Look at dingy Great Marlborough Street. Marry, 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 QED. So, uh, inherent to Darwin, I'm going to move away from Darwin's notes themselves uh, to think about transition, because Darwin is thinking about one era transitioning to another. But for the poet, that kind of transition can become a bit of a problem. Uh, T.S. Eliot, in his uh, four quartets, his political views aside, you caveat it similarly in your book, uh, he writes, 
For last year's words belong to last year's language, and next year's words await another voice. And what he does there is he links language to time. And so the idea is that we struggle to articulate what we want of the future because we don't have the words to describe what that future looks like. And so if you think about, say, the protests happening in India right now, there are accusations of, oh, it's leaderless, oh, they don't know where they're headed. But I wonder, thinking um, along the lines of Elliot, maybe it's because we don't have the language to articulate what we want that it gets messy. So, but then what that also throws up is the problem of the past. Because we don't have the language in trying to articulate the future, we rely on the past. And for us who are familiar with, say, the protest, it's an idea of an India of the past that was so glorious that will be the India of the future. And um, in your Beethoven poems, you seem to bring up this idea of transition as being uh, a conversation, sometimes a contention between the past and the present. I mean, sorry, the past and the mm. future. And so I was wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about these transitions and maybe read India Dreams and also Behind the Door. Yeah. So Beethoven lived at a time. I was. I was for the last year. I've been researching Beethoven's life, and. Um, he lived at a time of, of enormous change. He was born in 1770. When he was a young, a middle, middle teenager, the French Revolution was just happening. And um, he was very keen on it. Um, he was, you know, all for revolution. Um, and, until, and then Napoleon took over. And um, the, the, the guillotine had happened. People, you know, the, 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 the Marie Antoinette and so on had their heads chopped off. And then Napoleon took over, and Napoleon began to menace the place where he was now living, which was Vienna. And Vienna is a very pro problematic um, European city. It was, in, the, in that time, it was you know, really until the, the 20th century, I suppose. It was, it was the heart of diplomacy, um, and, um, and then it was the heart of music. And it was then, he, when Beethoven was born, it was the seat of the Holy Roman Empire, ruled by the Habsburgs. And um, he he came he he came in the teeth. He came at 21. He had to he had to pay the coachman extra to whip up the horses to get them past the armies to, into, to get into Vienna. Um, but then you know a lot of other things sort of happened. Um, Vienna was occupied twice by Napoleon, and he he scratched out Napoleon's name from his great symphony, the Third Symphony, the Eroica because he said when he was crowned emperor, that proved that he would just be a tyrant like all the rest of them. And he had hoped that he would be a man of the people who would be for the people instead of a tyrant and an emperor. Um, I know these have resonances all around the world today. Um, and goodness knows what's happening to the impeachment trial over in America. But, um, um, but when I went, of course, by the time I was there, Vienna meant something very different. And a German friend of mine once said, the Austrians have been very clever. They've somehow persuaded the world that um, Beethoven was um, Austrian, which he wasn't, he was German, and that Hitler was German, which he wasn't, he was Austrian. <laughs> um, and the, somehow this sense of Vienna as the place which colluded with, with the Nazis, which welcomed the, the Nazis in, in the Anschluss, um, and um, the you know, the, the events that happened there coincided in my mind when as I walked around Vienna, which is very, very, for those of you who haven't been to it or have seen pictures of it, it's some beautiful grand buildings, grand spaces, baroque everywhere. Um, but it's also the place where Freud lived. Freud had to get out. He got out the skin of his teeth just before, because he was Jewish, um, just before they, um, all his three, his three sisters were died in the camps, Freud's sisters. Um, and um, it's also the place where psychoanalysis, this idea that there's something within us all which, is, which we can't control, the unconscious, everything. It's, that's, I just felt that, you know, it's like the monster in the labyrinth coming up, curling up through the paving stones of this city, which is also a city of cover-up. So I'll, I'll just read this. This is one of the two big Beethoven museums in, in, um, in Vienna. The shadow behind the door. Ramparts of Vienna, an airy view Beethoven loved. 
the rooms where he rewrote Fidelio. Nothing gave him such trouble. I once asked a professional singer what it was like singing that first act quartet on stage. She said, the earth moves if you get it right. In shadow behind the door, a sign says, this museum was set up in 1941 when newspapers complained, Jews living in the house of Beethoven. And the family living here was sent to Theresienstadt, then Auschwitz. This sign behind the door is Europe too. We are all Vienna, the beautiful city you cannot trust. We know it now, know it again. We are creatures of division, evil and good, blown off course by a bitter wind and lost in a haunted wood. We are the dark, rift in the lute, fault in the bone, the light of enlightenment driven away by monsters at the heart and fallen feathers in the dirt like mornings. But earth still moves if you get it right. But later on, so that was when, when he was writing there, living there up on that nice edge, looking over the, the green woods, he was um, in his prime. He was going deaf. He was pretty deaf by then. But he was still writing. He was always in love. It never went very well, but he was, you know, he was, he was rushing around doing things. But then, and from 1812 onwards, something happens. Maybe it's the end of a, an unhappy love affair. Maybe he just got to the end of, maybe he was just fell into a depression. And really for about six years, he was hardly working. He was hardly writing. He um, tried once to starve himself to death for three days. Um, he was arrested as a tramp. He was filthy, he was negligent and everything. And he lived, he did a lot of reading. And out of this period and out of his reading, eventually would come the most sublime music he would ever write, his late period, but it took quite a long time for him to get there, and he couldn't, of course, know that he would find his late style through these six barren years of wilderness, really. But in this time, uh, he was reading um, Hindu mystics. He was reading Shakuntala, which was very, very popular from the sort of late 18th century. Goethe read it. Schubert wrote, tried to write an opera called Shakuntala. It didn't go where, he wasn't a natural opera composer, and it didn't work. But I'm, I was just so interested, and he copied out into his sketchbooks a little bit of the advice given to the wife in Shakuntala, looking for her husband. India dreams. You are even more alone. Ear trumpets don't help, but you pretend they do. Glass filled with the moon's dry wine, your shadow soft on the ceiling, a moment when every silence in the world conspires with every other, you write out notes of the Indian scale. You read Hindu mystics and Shakuntala. You copy the advice given to the faithful wife, searching for a husband cursed to forget her on how to endure. On your journey through this earth, your path will be now high, now low. The traces of your feet will be uneven. Virtue will drive you on. Giving up on Eros and his blindness, you cleave to Brahma, the one bright eye, a single coin of light opening in the dark of pagodas you picture on mountain peaks in India. What we forget makes us who we are. Most of our life vanishes in the swirls of the brain's mysterious mirror, but you can't stop looking back at scarlet pearls strewn through the desert, footprints of blood, your journey away from love. In that poem, In Dear Dreams, there's a line, uh, what we forget makes us who we are. And that obviously also shows us that we are historical creatures, but we also um, run the danger of forgetting that history. And we are now in a climate emergency. It's something that your work deals with. And um, 
this is a kind of history we are living through, and uh, we are we often overlook it, where uh, we run the risk of forgetting about it and forgetting how we got here. It's something we don't always talk about, and so I wonder what is the role of poetry now in the in the present as um, we think about what's going to happen to the world? Is it going to end? Because traditionally, poets have been in the business of building hope. But then there is also the poetry of witness. Um, it, the term is coined by uh, uh, an American poet named Carolyn Forche, and she talks about the poetry of witness uh, not being political or personal, but a social poetry that prevents us forgetting the horrors of history, that uh, it, it's a measure against forgetting. And so I wonder how you understand the poetry of witness, given mm. what's happening to the world right now. Well, I think poets do, but poetry is a very small art. Um, it, you know, it probably began, well, it certainly began in oral poetry as a sort of means of remembering things. Oral poetry, um, you know, it's, it's a way of, it's like the song lines in Australia poor Australia, um, uh, you know, it's some, you know, going through remembering you, where, you, where you are. And um, so that's certainly the beginning of, of poetry. And it's also now, a, a poet can react quickly. We can, we, we, yeah, we, poetry of witness is really important. Actually, it was, it was the po I think the phrase was coined not by Karolin Porsche, but by um, Chekhov Milos, the, yeah. the Polish poet, who was the, um, he wasn't Jewish, but he was actually probably the first poet to write a poem on the Holocaust. Um, he, he, in that poem, famous poem, A Poor Christian Looks at the Ghetto, which is hardly, it, it, it doesn't have any people in it. It does it entirely through um, ants and bees and the mole. I am very scared of the blind mole. Um, and um, you know he was watching the, the ghetto, the Warsaw ghetto, being torn down by the Nazis. Um, so it's an important, you know, how you you cannot not talk about what's happening. I uh, was wondering if you wanted to read uh, Maltese fishing boats. Um, oh yeah, okay. Um, well, I'm I'm very now exercised by climate refugees. If this is what's happening to refugees now, <coughs> what is what's it going to be like in five years' time? Um, but this, this Malta, this small island in the Mediterranean, has had a lot of refugees there, Me refugees trying to get away from Africa, and they're blown to Malta. They're trying to get to Europe, but they're blown to Malta. And um, the Maltese are very angry about it, um, resentful. There are huge numbers of African men wandering around Malta, which the Maltese haven't seen before. Um, and so <coughs> this is just this is something that happened. Um, Maltese fishing boat and broken net. They set off in a Phoenician fishing smack with the eye of Horus, coal outlined. The pupil turned in as if squinting on a double hull. High boughs of ochre, red and green, swoop waves, now indigo, now khaki, a bit of a swell. She's built to take six men with nets, with nets for amberjack, stone bass, white bream. Here's a Cayuco, the kind one sees limping into Tenerife, where migrants are trucked to La Aspanzaranza detention center, while the boat is sterilized and crushed. So low in the water, a hundred pairs of hands up to the elbows are batting the waves. <coughs> Where's the Frontex patrol? She's broadside. Now she's turned turtle. They're clinging on, slipping, pushing. Most can't swim, but some splash over, grab the net and pull us down. Cut the rope. What would you do? We lose our catch, but we get home. A hundred are drowning. Why should we six die too? <coughs> I don't think that's the best poem in the world. Well, I wrote it very quickly, but it does sort of sum up the problem. Um, just as Lesbos, I mean, the place where I was, um, that was, I was there in, in 2016, well that was four years ago, and now the Lesbos um, government is, is thinking of putting a barrier around the island so migrants can't get there. I mean, the camp where I went, which was built to hold 1,500 people, now holds nearly 11,000. There are rapes all the time, there's arson, there's violence, there are kids un sleeping outside, it's terrible. And you know, the island is suffering, the people are suffering, it's... Um, 
it's a microcosm of what's happening in the world. That's a very bleak idea and also horrifying. And I think it's horrifying because it is so true. Um, in the poem, there's a choice between the others and yourself. And it's this very immense moral question. And we have been failing with such moral questions uh, very consistently. But then that, that, that sort of horror is part of the poetry of witness. But then poetry also serves to create hope. It um, always has. And um, I wonder for you, how do you think about poetry for hope and poetry to document? There's a line at the end, in, the, in a poem at the end of this book, um, <clears throat> which is called Time to Fly, which is why any life form migrates from need. And, and it, at one point it says, um, you go um, because you need a place to shed your skin in safety. You go with a thousand questions, but you are growing up, growing old, moving on. Say goodbye to the might have beens. You can't step into the same river twice. You go because hope, need, and escape our names for the same God. And I think that's, that's really important. And I, I actually, I thought I might finish on a, hope is one of the things, of course, that powers migration. Hope and the need for a new home. You abandon one home because you, your home is lost and you need another home. And it's hope of that home, better home, that drives you. But also, Migration, I thought, thought so much about migration, what, you know, the metaphors of migration all the time. And um, my daughter, when I started this, was sort of just 16. And um, I thought of adolescence as a kind of migration too. You step over the boundary into the grown-up world beyond. So shall I read this poem to finish yeah. up? Because it's, um, I was thinking about the monarch butterflies which fly from Mexico to, to North America and back again. Three generations of them are born and die and mate and go on while this migration happens. So this is a constant flux of these beautiful butterflies. Um, but also, um, you know, people grow up. Teenagers grow up, go on, they migrate into new worlds. So this is called Ripples on New Grass. When all this is over, said the princess, this bothersome growing up, I'll live with wild horses. I want to race tumbleweed, blowing down a canyon in Wyoming, dip my muzzle in a mountain tarn. I intend to learn the trails of Ishmael and Ashtarte beyond blue ridges, where no one can get me. Find a bird with a pearl inside, heavy as 10 copper coins. Track the luminous red wind that brings thunder and go where ripples on new grass shimmer in a hidden valley only I shall know. I want to see autumn swarms of monarch butterflies, saffron, primrose, honey brown, blur sapphire skies on their way to the gulf a gold skein over the face of ocean, calling all migrants home. Thank you very much. Uh, we have some time for questions. Please do articulate your view as a question, and if you could keep it to one and not many pronged, that would be helpful. I think there's a microphone up there. Thank you. You do say that for writing, there's a deep connection with the outside world. And so I'm, my question is, how do you alchemize I mean, the outside world with the inner world of your writing, of your poetry? How do the two landscapes alchemize? That's a really interesting question. And actually, the first, uh, the first prose book I ever wrote was called In and Out of the Mind. <laughs> so, so you're back, you're spot on. Um, um, I think one level of answer is I don't know. Um, um, what, what happens, what I see happening outside makes a difference to, to what I think about. I mean, a lot of it is, is through reading, because reading is also this mysterious alchemy. We, you know, we, with these, here are these things on the page called black and white words, and they go into our mind, and they do something to us, and then our words come out, our ideas come out. Um, but I think also, um, 
I'd like to talk a little bit about science because, um, you know, because I, I'm, I'm not a scientist, but I discovered when I started to work on evolution and tiger biology and everything that, I'm, that I, it's not that different from any other thing, really. You just have to, it's got different words, but it's the same thing of, of, um, of, of, of learning and obeying the evidence and so on. And I realized that science and poetry are so similar. You observe, you look at something, and um, you have to get it accurately. You want to be accurate. Um, poetry that's just woolly and abstract is no poetry at all, as far as I'm concerned. It's got to be precise. Um, and um, both of them, they, it lives in the particulars, that word particular. It lives in the particular, and it's through the particular, the small particular, that you get to the universal. Poetry is about big things, but you get to at it through the small things. And that's how, how Darwin worked. I mean, he, he worked for seven years on barnacles, and he worked on um, bees and earthworms. He loved earthworms, because earthworms actually keep the world alive, the soil alive. So it was through looking at the really small things and the small differences between birds' feathers or beetles' legs that you get to the big things and the rules and the laws of, of, of evolution. So I suppose I'm used to, and I, I like that swing between the very small and the concrete and the big and what's, what happens to us. Yeah. Lovely. There's a corollary to that question. Uh, sort of observing you as a polymath. And how do you migrate into that polymathic state? And do you return back like a bird, or are you a human being who goes around further? Well, I think I evolved rather than migrated into it. But I, um, there are lots of things I don't know how to do. Um, I'm not very good with um, other people's showers or washing machines. <laughs> <laughs> and I really get very worried about, about um, you know, f electronic forms when I have to fill those in, and I can always mess them up. So I, don't, I wouldn't call me a polymath. Um, but I am very interested in the natural world. Um, and the people world as well. Um, and so there's one book I recently wrote. Um, I was asked to, to, to do it by my publisher. She said, we, we, we want a book about Christmas. I, I'm not going to write a book about Christmas. <laughs> um, but then I thought, well, I have a friend. He's um, from Maharashtra. He's a, a, a psychologist. He's a psychiatrist. And he works on, he's the psychiatrist for the homeless in the area where I live in London and Camden. So I said, Sushrit, will you take me around all the, all the homeless hostels at Christmas? So we went around them. So then I did a story which, it, okay, was set at Christmas, but it was really about homelessness. It was about the homeless on the London streets and what's happening to them. Um, so um, I then got interested in that. And once you start learning and researching, you know, you, you, I go on. <laughs> yes. Anyone else? Um, the author of The Hungry Tide, Amitav Ghosh, has recently, or in the past few years, written about... Uh, the author of The Hungry Tide, Amitav Ghosh, has recently written about uh, the kind of divide that um, exists between like, what people consider civilization and what people consider the natural world, and uh, the inability of novels, particularly in the present day, to... Um, kind of merge those two together and um, the necessity of such um, craft emerging uh, with the changing of the world as it is right now. Could you talk yes. about your thoughts? Yes, I mean, he's, he's, always, he's often been very interested. I mean, he's written this book about the climate emergency. He's also, the recent novel, Gun Island, um, he's, he's got very interested in the interpenetration, really, of our spirituality with with um, with what's happening in in the natural world, and I think that's a that's a wonderful and important vision. I'll go with that. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, mean, I think he's it's a very he's a, he's a very important voice. Um, there's this book novel uh, by a novelist I read recently called whom I met at, at Jaipur called The Latitudes of Longing. I can't remember her name. Shubhangi Swaroop. Yeah, I thought it's a brilliant book. If you haven't read it, it's it takes the the the, the fault. Um, it's from the Andaman Islands up through to the, to the Tibetan Plateau. And the people who live along it and the different lives lived along it. Um, and um, we should have more of that. More, because in anyway, where I live, 
I'm often very hurt by the, you know, a lot of the people I live among are literary London. I, I regard them as, you know, most of them went to university. I regard them as, as sophisticated people, but they have no idea about um, conservation. So one of them said to me, monkeys, well, monkeys aren't, aren't endangered. Have you any idea how many species of monkeys there are? What about the lion-headed tannerins in, 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 you know, in the Western Ghats and so on? And she, it, they just think that if the, if the animal is there in a zoo, then it's going to be all right, um, which is sort of rubbish. And, and when I get upset about it, they just they lie, they say, oh, Ruth. <laughs> Um, but you know they, they don't because people people like that dearly though I love them are so cut off from the natural world and what um, Amitav Ghosh has done he's really gone into the you know into the Sundarbans and so on and felt it. In fact, uh, the, my my novel where the serpent lives um, is in some of that territory as well of, of the the um, snake goddess. Um, I think she's called Manasa up there in, in the in the northeastern, and, and um, you know the sense that we have, which actually Darwin didn't want to lose of whatever the sublime means, whatever is really important to you, um, you can feel it there. I mean, when I was when I was in Sumatra, um, looking for tigers, and I was up on the top of this volcano in this really high, pristine rainforest, very dry, um, and we saw a tiger's a pug mark. Um, and we knew that the tigress was there. And then we went off the track and sat down. And the, it, the forest went very still. And I just thought, this is, you know, if, anywhere, if gods are going to walk anywhere, they're going to walk here. It felt like the roof of the world. And then, from behind, on the path that we'd just been on, there was this, like, cough. <coughs> and then there was a twig that snapped. And then the stillness of the forest faded. It was very strange. The birds started to sing again. And I said to my guide, what was that? And she said, that, that happens when there's a predator around, a major predator around, and you feel the forest go still, the monkeys stop. And then we went out on the track, and there, over my own um, trainer, was laid a new, fresh tiger pug mark. And I thought, wow, she has looked at us. We didn't see her, but she saw us, and she went along her way. Uh, you know, she was preserving our safety and hers, and that was all fine. And I felt, I felt the sublime there. <laughs> I want to know, uh, how does a writer or a, or a, or a very distinguished poet uh, relate himself or herself with this hideous entity called the nation state i mean uh, i'm an ex soldier myself and uh, you know i've 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 been i've been through i mean although i've not fought a war i have uh, been at uh, the cutting edge of a planning stage at war college and you know uh, imagining uh, the enemy and us and and what not and today when i come back uh, to the civil society, I, I find as if the entire world is going to go up in smoke and I can't do anything about it. So, I mean, a pointed question is, how does a writer or, or I mean, writers are the ones who can, you know, influence uh, uh, a society or uh, a decision maker. So how does he or she relate himself to this, this amorphous entity called nation state? I mean, I, I, I'm at my, I, I'm at my wit's end to even, you know, fathom this whole thing. I, I, I mean, and, and to be very frank, I think writers and uh, poets do have, a, do have it in them to kind of call this out. I mean, how does one go about it? Well, that's a really, really important um, question you've asked. And I think the world everywhere in this country, which I don't know very well, um, and in America and in my own country, which has just taken the most mad decision and is leaving the Unip European Union tonight. Um, and um, we have to speak truth as we see it. Um, and, um, you know, Seamus Heaney said something important. He said, no poem has ever stopped a tank. You know, um, if you think of that, that famous <coughs> picture in Tiananmen, just one man in front of the tank. Um, you know, saying a poem wouldn't have cut much mustard. Um, but um, it is the poets whom, for instance, the Soviet Union and censors go after when censorship comes down. The, a lot of poets during the, during the Soviet time, 
the four famous poets, Akhmatova, Svetayeva, um, Pasternak, and Mandelstam. You know, they were imprisoned, they died in exile, they were put in camps. Um, why? Because they were poets, because they dared to say things. Um, and, you know, we have to stand up. Um, I wonder if it's only poets, though, because now we have this other, other um, art form called the film. And films, I think, reach more people and um, also say truth. And that's, that's another thing that was happening. I went to, in, in um, <coughs> it's not just now, Shakespeare was, was faced this question, exactly the question that you're asking too. Um, I think people have faced it in lots of different societies in lots of different ways. And I went to a really wonderful talk by a professor called Stephen Greenblatt, who's just written a book called Tyrant. Now, he's American. He doesn't use the word Trump in it, but he talks about, he's talking about Trump the whole time, but he's talking also about Shakespeare and how Shakespeare got around a censor. How he did is that he always portrayed his, his um, characters at least 100 years before where they're going, where, where they are now. Um, he, some people were hung, drawn, and quartered for putting on Richard III um, at a particular time, um, um, but Shakespeare was not touched. Ben Jonson spent time in jail. Um, and he, he was talking, he's talking about how he saw that a really wicked, um, unscrupulous man, he said, that's the question, how does an unscrupulous man who is clear, clearly fraudulent offering fraudulent promises to the populace, how does he get the populace to buy into his lies? You know, that's what happened in, that's what's happened in my country. You know, what Boris Johnson has lied the whole way, time, the whole way through. And, um, um, you know, they know it. Somehow they know it. They, they want to believe the lies, they buy into it. And so Shakespeare's answer is that there are enablers. There are people who are self-serving, who will um, <coughs> make a profit from from putting him on the, on the throne. There are people who say, well, it can't be as bad as all that. The institutions will hold. There are people who just don't see it. So there are lots of different enablers who enable the tyrant to persuade the populace to put him on the throne against their, against their own wishes. Now, that's, that's dramatic poetry. Lyric poetry, which is on the whole the kind I write, um, you know, you just have to do the kind of poetry of witness. This is what Milos was doing, that, that poem that I mentioned, um, the, the, A Poor Christian Looks at the Ghetto. He w that, was, that was where then, um, under the Nazis in Poland, but then he lived through into the Soviet times in Poland, and he couldn't stand that because um, he, he saw exactly the same sorts of corruption happening, the sorts of repression happening. Um, so he got out and, and went to, to Paris but the French at that time in the 50s didn't want to hear that the communists could do bad things. And so eventually he ended up in um, California. Um, so, um, but he, he evolved ways of talking that evaded the censorship. Just as Shakespeare put everything in the past, other people, especially in Eastern Europe, evolved ways of talking so that people know what they're talking about and they can tell the truth as they see it without them and their families being hacked to pieces. And I think somewhere it has to also do with, um, th not the poem in its current historical moment, yes, uh, poets might write the truths they see, but um, a very great quality uh, about poetry is that it survives. Uh, when Auden writes uh, in memory of W.B. Yeats, he says, for poetry made nothing happen, but it um, survives as a happening, a mouth. And that is the danger of it, the very fact that we have inherited Shakespeare in order to talk about the tyrants of our time. So in some ways, maybe the, the danger of poetry is not that it's going to stop a tank tomorrow, but that it will live on. Yes, good poem. But, but the trouble is, Poetry can be a, a double-edged sword. I mean, you can... Um, Radovan Karavic, who was this war criminal in Serbia, he was a, a supposedly a poet too. And people... Um, the trouble with... I think this partly rhyme. 
we go back to the oral poetry and what one of the one of the sort of wonderful things about poetry is that it, it is memorable and also anyway in english i don't know different forms of, of poetry here of, um, in different indian languages but in english if you have a rhyme it feels more believable because the two words rhyme even if it's a bad thing to say it's i mean it still feels more believable so it's a double edged sword um, and I, I, I'm afraid I don't think poets can pull us out of the hole that we're all the world is in, but um, they do have the responsibility to speak truth. There's there's a a big a big difference between poetry and rhetoric, and Yeats said, uh, rhetoric we make out of the quarrel with others. Poetry is what we make out of the quarrel with ourselves. And I think that this is important too. You have to be true to your own imagination. You can't just address the, the climate tri crisis or the, the, the current tyrant because you feel angry about it. You, it's got to be within you. Yeah. Okay, so I know art is a very selfless thing to do, any form of art. But as a poet, as a writer, what is your biggest take back in all these years of writing and in poetry? What is your biggest take back for you? Like, what do you get out of it? Well, actually, I just love writing poems. <laughs> <laughs> so I do love writing. And when you, when you get it, when, you, when you've done something to your, to you think it works, um, that's, that's one thing. And then also when somebody comes up to you, not the big... I mean, I, li I like doing things to audiences and so on, and it's lovely to get feedback. But the important thing is, first of all, making it. And then somebody might come up shyly to you afterwards and say, I love that thing. It's just how I felt. I, re I recently wrote a book about my mother's, my mother's death. Um, and um, it was a quite quiet book in some ways. Um, but it's, it's nice when somebody comes up and says, you're... Your book, those poems made so much difference to me, it hel or they helped me. And then I think, oh, that's nice. Um, yes. So, yes, so in your writing process, uh, you spoke about the juxtaposition between the small concrete things and the larger intangible picture. So I was wondering, do you think there's a pattern of which one occurs to you first? Is it the small concrete thing that's m that makes you think of the larger intangible, or do you go looking for the larger intangible in the small concrete things? I think I look at the small thing and then the big thing occurs to me. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I might look at ripples on a pool and see how the shadow comes and then think, well, that's how shadow comes when light is falling. I, don't know. <coughs> I, I recently went to a, an exhibition of Rembrandt um, and um, apparently he used light um, in a way to sort of show up the relationships between people. So you might have a very dark um, inn, um, and there are two people talking, and there is light just on one of them, the face, and a little bit of their hand, there's the other one's hand. And this is about the communication between them, and I think that's, that's really exciting, that you can just get that light, and then it illuminates the relationship between them. And, and I think I think that's what I, how I, the ideal of it anyway. Yeah. Have a question. Yes. Uh, do you find I mean, I'm sure you do that the things you write uh, or the meanings you had in mind when you wrote something are not exactly quite what the uh, readers pick up, and sometimes it's actually uh, diametrically opposite. So. Yes, of course. Yes. And all how the do time. you deal with that? Yes. Or do you come to accept it as a occupational hazard of sorts? I don't even think it's a hazard. I mean, they were, nobody will necessarily get what you thought, and you, you may not know what you have put into the poem anyway. Um, well, when you, I mean, you know, it's, you put into that much, but there's all the iceberg below the surface, as it were. Um, and people will see, it's, it always entrances me when people see things in it that I didn't see. Sometimes I don't agree with them. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's um, there's a, the, the poet Geoffrey Hill was very amused once. He wrote a poem about growing up in the war. And he talked about off the M6, which is the motorway that goes up to the north from yeah. London. And it's off the M6. And there was an American 
um, who introduced him or wrote about it and said, and it, he says about the Lord of the M6 or something, he said, this was because he was working for MI6, the <laughs> intelligence agency. Um, you know, getting it completely wrong. Um, and then there was another occasion when I used to write a column in, um, in, on every, sun, every Sunday in a Sunday paper in, in London. And um, I'd written about a poem, a quite mysterious poem by a, an Irish, a, a woman poet in Ireland. And um, she wrote a quite mysterious poem, which is, I think, it was, this was a time of a lot of IRA bombings, and I think it was before the peace process in, in Ireland, Northern yeah. Ireland. And I think that that's what I suggested, that it was about um, somebody trying to leave the IRA. Um, and there's a, there was a line, in it, I want to be in this place where there are shadows of blue trees and I can hear the milk crawl as it turns into cream or something like that. Sure. Anyway, it was... Um, I wrote this poem, and a lot of people would cut those things out of the paper. It was before, before the internet, probably. And um, somebody wrote to me and said, you wrote, you wrote about this poem. It was a beautiful poem, and I, I've lost it. I cut it out, and it, I lost it. The dog ate it or something. And um, um, it had a line in it, I think, about making milk crawl. And I think it was about a civil servant retiring. <laughs> I'd never, I'd never <laughs> said that, but he had brought his own life to that, and you know that's. So I thought he brought, he brought what he had to the poem, and it spoke to him about something. And I, I feel that too. That, that that's what I mean. You don't necessarily know what you're putting in True. to the poem. Um, and in fact, when you're writing the poem, if you know what you're going to write, you know why bother to write the poem? Um, you, you, you know, you should. You write to discover. You write to discover what you feel, um, in a way. Yeah. So I think we are out of time. Thank you all very much. Uh, thank you, Ruth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Books. Yes. Um, Ruth's books are available outside, and she is happy to sign them. So do get copies. Do ask her to sign them because she might not be here soon. <laughs> well, I mean, I will, I will still be. We, she'll be chasing <laughs> elephants. What I mean is she'll be out in a jungle chasing elephants for her next book. So <laughs> now's the chance. Anyway, thank you. Mm.